Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. This is awesome. This is Dr. Phoebe Eva for How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Vulnerability Management. So the very first question is, I've been asked this every time I've heard anybody over the week talk, what on earth? Why Dr. C.B. Eva? It's actually a reference to a fundamental satire made back in the 50s about nuclear war and the end of the world. And it seemed like an appropriate metaphor because this is, all, in many ways, a war that you cannot possibly win. Uh, and it is full of just really well-meaning people who want to do the right thing to make awful decisions. Um, so why do I talk about this? Who am I about this? Well, I've spent most of my career either as the victim or the perpetrator of the vulnerability management program. Uh, both sides of it, I've been on the infrastructure side trying to like go fix stuff people are telling me is wrong. And I've also been on the security side of here. You should go fix stuff. It's wrong. And I've seen it done wrong lots of times. And so now I want to kind of help people do it right. So a little bit, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Ben Webb. Uh, you'll find me online as Ben from KC. I've been in technology and security roles for coming up in 30 years now, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, right now, I'm the, the manager of engineering and technology at Recon InfoSet, uh, where we do managed security operations. If that's something you're interested in, or if just want to know what those words mean, hit me up later because I'm not talking about it for this talk. Uh, and as Aaron said, I grew up in this area, has been here for a long time, but reached escape velocity uh, last fall. Now you can find me on the set KC Discord, which you should totally check out, uh, as Ben from KC, just, you know, posting the random crap that we post, and occasionally giving good advice. So... The three things that we're going to talk about, this is always how I organize discussing vulnerability management. We start with the precepts. Precepts are things that you have to understand before any of this makes sense. If you walk in not understanding kind of how the world works or what matters, none of it's going to make sense to you, and you're going to make these terrible self-defeating decisions that we see all the time. The next thing will be the process. It's a fairly straightforward way of going through and getting actual value, not just compliance, out of a vulnerability management program. And then the last thing I'm going to cover is the point. What you're actually trying to get to, what your goals should be, and actually even some ways to, to measure it. Spoiler alert, though. The real point of this is to figure out the best thing you can do right this minute to improve your environment. Because in 10 minutes, it's different. Tomorrow, it's different. Next week, it's different. Figure out what's the activity that will make the most impact right away that can actually fill you up. So let's get started. I'll we'll start with the precepts. The very first thing you have to understand about vulnerability management, you probably sat down and got some sort of scan of Tenable or Revit 7 or whatever. This data is terrible. It is absolute crap. It is full of just junk. It doesn't make sense, doesn't apply, it is worthless. So start by just understanding that you're not going to have good data. You are going to have directional data, data that is vaguely correct and can tell you some important things or some worthwhile things if you look at it the right way. But if you try to look at it row by row by row, it is junk and it is unhelpful. The next thing, and it kind of dovetails with the first, is that the idea of prioritization is just a myth. Every organization I've been in at some point says, you know what we should do? We should just get a list of the CBEs out of this scan. And then we're going to go around to the people that own those CBEs and tell them to fix them. And it's going to be great. <laughs> All right. So people are laughing, so they have some idea that it doesn't work. Because what happens, right? You take this list of CBEs with an imagined owner. And you say, hello, owner, system admin, or, or whoever. Look at these CVEs. You should fix them. And the first thing they say is, what's a CVE? <laughs> what are these numbers? What are you even asking me to do? And by the time you've gotten that part of the conversation, a chromium zero day has come out, and your entire prioritization is left in any of this. So it cannot work that way. You have to look for better things. You can't just say, well, we're going to prioritize it and fix it all. The next thing to understand is the CVSS scoring system is not a risk metric. So many, like the media loves this. They hop on a new thing and it's a 9.8 CVSS. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Lots of 9.8 CVSS CVEs come out that are never exploited. It doesn't matter. 
It's not about risk, it's about severity. And besides that, it doesn't really apply to your environment. A 10.0 CVSS score sitting inside of a firewall that only three people can get through probably doesn't make a difference. So you can't just look at the scores and say, well, this is it. This is the this is what we do. We start at the top and work down. No. The next thing, back to our uh, nuclear war metaphor, there is no winning use. You can survive, but you're never going to stop and say, all right, I have one vulnerability management. We're good. It is a process that you will continue and continue and continue. It is a rolling fly wheel. It is not a one time we're going to get this project done and now vulnerability is solved. Next thing, and I probably, I, I debate every time I talk about this, whether you start with this. The vulnerability condition of your environment is not a metric of you, of your success, of your team's success, of your society's success. It is a metric of how bad the world sucks. <laughs> Software is hard. It isn't a simple thing, and it's not your fault, and it's not your team's fault. It was never the intern that didn't hatch something. It's, that's not what we're talking about here. And sitting down and saying, well, these people suck at their job, and so we have vulnerabilities is not how this goes. Software is hard to do. If it was easy, elementary school kids would do it, none of us would have jobs. So don't take it personally. Don't let your team or, or the people you work with take it personally. It's just not that. Next thing is vulnerability management cannot replace organizational discipline. If you don't have a patching program in your organization already, vulnerability management will not help you. All it will do is say, you need a patching program to go find them. There's, it is not, cannot be the driver behind that. If you're not doing like configurations for your systems, if you're not doing a secure baseline and then maintaining that, vulnerability management cannot help you. All it can do is say, you should go secure your systems and have a secure baseline. It's not going to help you actually do any of it. Do any of that. And the last thing, and this might be the most important, kind of back to the first one, you can ignore almost all of the vulnerability data. Most of it is stuff that makes absolutely no difference to you. Should never be looked at by anyone, let alone you, your management, any of your peers, anybody else in the world. And we'll get to why that is and how we do that here in just a minute. So let's talk about the process. The very first thing you do is you gather your data. Duh. You've got to start from somewhere. Um, easiest thing to do, <coughs> every vulnerability you've got in your environment, regardless of score, regardless of technology, whatever, put them in a big pile. And this is the second part, the second thing you need is actually very important. Go get the technology, for every technology you have, go get the patching process and the schedule. What is the cadence? When do you patch your Windows systems? Figure you probably got a thousand, five thousand Windows desktops somewhere, maybe a couple thousand servers, some Linux. When you patch Linux, how often? Is that quarterly? Is it monthly? Is it weekly? Do you just run after get update every day? Find those things out because it matters. It's going to matter a lot to this process. And it should. So once you have that, very first thing you want to do is restore that data. Again, CVSS is terrible for this. Um, I always hesitate a little bit to do it. This is actually a place where a commercial product fits pretty well. There's lots of rescoring services out there. Uh, companies like Reported Future and Canada Security and things like that will do this. The community is trying to do a better job but it's not really there yet. If you have a like a threat intelligence program, this is a good place for them to fit in because a lot of those types of services can do it. But what you're trying to do here is wash out the junk. So offensive security people love to get a CVE. They're like, yeah, I'm awesome. I've got look at my list of CVEs on my resume, which makes sense. It's a, it's a good bone for them. It's great to have out there. But it leads to them like leaning into getting more CVEs and finding more things. The truth of it is, 90 plus percent of them never get exploited because nobody cares. You want to wash all that junk out. If you have TLS 1.0 in your environment, for every endpoint you have, if they can downgrade to TLS 1.0, you've probably got three CVEs right there. Nobody cares. Doesn't matter, can't be exploited, presents no risk, worthless data. You want to be able to score all that stuff down into oblivion. Now, once you've done that, rescore it again. 
How risky does this actually work in your environment? For instance, a cross-site scripting vulnerability sitting on an internet-facing web application is a huge deal. You don't want to leave that. A cross-site scripting vulnerability sitting on, on a web application that runs a storage array that's behind a firewall that only four people in the whole company can reach and requires a static IP address is probably not such a big deal and should be scored down. It has to be scored down because there's a good chance you're never going to fix that stupid thing anyway. So it's important to get these things kind of environmentally aware. Again, this is where your uh, threat intelligence program, if you have something like that, can really help you out because they can help you work with what's actually applicable to you. Once you've done that, now you smush the data. Technical term, smush the data together. Um, really, there's a lot of things you can learn from this data. You can bend it and twist it and, and pull all sorts of interesting gee whiz kind of numbers out of it. I used to have like 35 different views of this pile of data. But ultimately, what you really want to know is what's your fix activity? Is it a patch? Probably, but 90% of the time it is. Um, or is there some other kind of thing? Is there a configuration change that you've got to make? You want to know when it was first detected? How old is this thing? How long has it been sitting there? And we'll get to why that's important in a minute. And then, and this is super important, and this is why you did got all your patches cadences. When's it going to get fixed? In your normal day-to-day -day operation, when will it be fixed? So it came out today. It came out on Patch Tuesday. Is it going to get fixed at the end of the week? Is it going to get fixed at the end of the month? Is it going to get fixed at the end of the quarter? What's your team already doing? That's important to know because that's how we make this work. And this is what we do with Master. Um, you can do it with Python and SQLite. You can do it with Power BI. You can do it with Tableau or whatever data processing thing you want to do. Uh, it's probably a bit much for Excel. If you've got an environment, um, let's just say you've got a couple thousand workstations, a couple thousand servers, Patch Tuesday hits, you might have a half a million vulnerability show up. So you've got to have something that can handle that kind of data. Then we filter. Filtering this data down is the most important thing you can do because why? It's crap. Most of it is not going to be relevant to you and you need to find the things that are. A half a million vulnerabilities sorting through, you're not going to find the 15 or the 20 that you actually need to worry about. So all that stuff that's going to be fixed in the next week or two, it's within the patch cycle for the technology, get rid of it. Doesn't matter. It does not matter that a half a million vulnerabilities show, just showed up in your environment if you're patching them in a week. Nobody needs to know. Nobody needs to report on it. It's not a big deal. It's just life. This goes up and down every month for everybody all the time, and it makes no difference to anything. As long as you're patching, you're good. And having all that stuff in there and trying to report on it and trying to metric it is going to keep you from finding the things that matter. And then get rid of the stuff that you are never going to fix anyhow. Uh, there's lots of that. If you're... If your standards say, you know what, we're going to have these ports open from everything, don't don't report on those vulnerabilities. You know, if you're not enforcing TLS 1.2, all the CVEs associated with TLS 1.0 and 1.1, get rid of it. It doesn't matter. It's not going to help. You're never going to go away until you change your standards. So don't don't fuss over it. Those aren't vulnerabilities in your environment. You've accepted that risk. Move on. Now you're down to a workable bit of data, and you can figure out what's the most important thing that you can be doing right now in your environment. Because now that you're down to workable data, you can figure out what are the most vulnerable systems you have. What are the ones that are showing a bunch of CVEs still? Because you already weeded out everything that you were going to patch, so everything that's within cycle. These are things where patching is not working. Go figure out why patching didn't work. Is, is, is SCCM busted? Is satellite not working? Did you have a collective 2019 get missed in SCCM this month? Now you can see that. You can look at the data and say, okay, here's a bunch of systems that have a bunch of stuff on them still. Patching has happened, but we've taken everything out as the patching get fixed. What's going on there? Now you've got something you can actually chase down. Um, and then look for things that have a really broad distribution. Uh, this happens a lot of times if you, if you don't read every Microsoft release, 
and you don't realize that there's some follow-on registry fee that has to be set or something like that. Where you might not have, you might have applied a patch that maybe it's not totally implemented. Maybe you've got something that's just not going well. You've got to figure out why. Maybe your, uh, I don't know, your Acrobat updates didn't work this time. Figure out the things that are affecting a large <coughs> When I say large, you know, I throw out there five percent of it. Depends on the size of your environment. Five percent seems to be pretty good. If you've got a hundred systems and five of them all showing the same vulnerability, it's probably worth looking at why. If you've got a thousand and fifty of them, well, yeah, those are probably reasonable numbers. But you know, it's an issue. Figure out what works for your environment. And then, because management loves reporting, you have to actually report on those things, right? So what are things you actually can look for? Because if you don't tell management something, they're just assuming that you're not doing it. So start with the overall trend. Um, and when I say trend, I mean trend. This is not specific numbers. This is not we were at 200 this month and 300 next month and 150 last month. Work with like rolling averages. This month is higher or lower than our three month rolling average and our six month rolling average. Um, you know, have some idea, but don't get too specific with it because, again, this isn't, you're not measuring what your team's doing, you're measuring how bad the world sucks. Um, also, there's probably things you're not patching. There's, you know, vendors are terrible, and some of them are like, well, we can't support our software unless it's Windows 2012. <laughs> Figure out what those things are, how much risk they present. Your scanner is going to tell you that, or at least some level of it. And kind of just have a metric for that. Have an idea of how ugly is this really? When uh, our finance team will let us update the PeopleSoft servers, how bad, how ugly is that game? That's a good thing to know and something worth reporting. And then back to your operational discipline, how many things fit into this? How many, how many technologies do you have that don't have a patching process here? You probably got Windows, you probably got Linux. What about your routers? What about that Juniper stack you've got sitting back in the corner that nobody wants to touch? How many things are falling outside of this right now? That's an important thing to, be, to keep an eye on because it speaks to the overall health of your environment. And if you can move that forward, you're improving rate strides of your environment because most of this is just about having a good operation at this point. And then monitoring. And then what are the gaps? How much crap is in your scanner that you can't identify? It's, this is not a zero number. Nobody's like perfectly clean and like, oh yeah, we've got every endpoint down and we know them all and they're all in, all in the CMDB and it's perfect. No. But how much is there? Do you have 25% of your endpoints that, that show up as IP addresses that you're not sure what they are? Do you have 10%? Do you have 5%? Just, it's a good metric to understand how well you're monitoring your overall environment. Make sense? Oh. So this is a fairly short talk, and I cut it down a bit, but this can be a really valuable process to an organization. It can't be a driver for every organ for your entire organization's patching and configuration, but it can provide a lot of value in monitoring those things. At any given point, the whole the whole reason you're doing this is to understand what's the best thing we can do today. Because when you can figure that out, if you can say, well, here's the system that did patch last month. Or here's the systems where GPO didn't push down, or here's the systems where somebody went out and made some changes that they shouldn't have. That's really valuable activity. That helps your environment forward. If you're sitting there going, well, we remediated 450,000 vulnerabilities this month because we patched Windows, and that's better than the 470 or 420,000 vulnerabilities we patched last month, that's not helpful. Because out of all that, you missed whatever. You, you didn't see those systems that didn't hatch. You didn't see those systems that didn't get GPF. So get all that out and find the thing that's the most important you can be doing right now. And the last thing is, and I'll, I'll say this again, and I'll, I'll probably say it to someone else later. This is not a measurement of your performance, your team's performance, your peers' performance. The world sucks. This is a way to get through it and make things better while you're at it. It is not a way to tell people they're not doing a good job, or to, I've just seen this, especially from management, when they want to come in, like, oh, well, this team's not doing very good because their numbers are down. I'm like, well, that team manages the technology. It's awful. They have bad vendors. It's what it is. So don't, 
take this, you know, find that thing that you need to work on. Tell yourself, yeah, I did a great job. I have killed it today. Sure, there's X number of vulnerabilities, but you know, we really push things forward and we're doing good work. And smile and go home and have a drink. Because <laughs> you're going to come back tomorrow and Chrome's going to happen again. And you're going to get right back to where you were and you're like, ah, this. So keep your head up because it's, it's good work and it's important work, but it doesn't ever finish itself up. So thank you, thank you very much for coming out for this. Um, I know it's not the, the, the hackerish of hacking talks, but I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate people attending cons like this because they're a lot of fun. And if people don't come to them, they don't have them. Uh, big thanks to B-Sides KC. This is always a great event. Really enjoy it. Um, and I, I've got to put you know, my Twitter a little bit. Thanks to Recon InfoSec for letting me do this kind of thing. If you like this topic or <coughs> defensive security type topics, join us for Thursday Defense. Uh, it's every Thursday. It's a conversation, not a presentation. It's a bunch of really bright security minds hanging out on a Zoom call and talking. And it's a lot of fun. And also, if you like uh, defensive security topics and you're kind of into that sort of thing, we are hiring a senior SOC analyst. So if you're interested in something like that, hit me up later. And I obviously have to thank Seth Casey. Uh, they're an absolutely wonderful organization. I will tell you, I like I said, I made Escape Velocity last fall. It is the one thing out of Kansas City, and we stuff like that aside, that I missed. Uh, it's a great organization. It's a privilege that you can make it out to the meeting because they are asked to be fantastic. You will learn something and meet amazing people every time. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day.